Bule Baba Ki Je. If you remember in our last discourse, we were speaking about Veda Vyasa wanting a son and going to Lord Shiva and doing great tapasya for 100 years. And Shiva granted him the boon that he would have a son. So Veda Vyasa went back to his hermitage and there rubbing two sticks together in preparation to make a fire and cook some food after 100 years of fasting, all of a sudden he was wondering about how was he ever going to have a son since he was not married and had no wife. And out of the blue, this beautiful celestial nymph arrived and was floating in the air above him and looking askance at him and he became amorously attached to her and started going in his mind about how inappropriate this would be because she was just full of lust and he was and that that would not make a good household or a marriage. And then he also remembered the story of, of a king that lost everything and became totally enamored with a celestial nymph, nymph to his uh, great uh, dismay at the end. And so, of course, as we go into the chapter uh, 13, the Munis are asking him about this story. Chapter 12 and 13 are about this story of how this king had been overtaken by this beautiful celestial nymph. And it begins with the story of Chandradev and Tara having a child, a son, and his name was Bhuta. And Bhuta um, grew up to be a very beautiful, uh, kingly man also. And he was wandering one time near a forest and he saw this beautiful woman who had actually indeed been a king. And the king had wandered into this beautiful forest, which was an enchanted forest, and he had become a woman. He couldn't figure out what had happened, and the story was that Lord Shiva was in this forest at one point, um, having amorous affairs with his wife, Uma, and some um, sadhus had come to visit him, some munis, and had seen her in her nakedness, and she was become very afraid and distraught. And so Shiva made a, a pact that anyone that came into the uh, forest would become a woman. So this king had become a woman, and now she was called Ila, and Budi meant El Ila, and uh, they became very much attached and had a beautiful son. And his, his name was uh, Pururava. Puru and in time, he became the king and was a very excellent king, uh, endowed with all good qualities and giving um, many things to charity and also doing many sacrifices and um, with an abundance of dakshina, sacrificial fees, and also gave so much money to uh, people in need. So it was a very dharmic, good king that knew all about uh, the ways of a kingdom. And then one time, a celestial nymph named Uravasa had been uh, cursed to come to earth. And she looked down onto the earth and saw this beautiful king who was very uh, well endowed and she decided that she would spend her time on earth with him. However, she had some stipulations that she had two sheep and she was going to entrust their care to the king and if ever they got stolen, she would leave him. And also that if she ever saw him without his clothes on, except when they were ha making love, that she would also leave him. And uh, so for many, many, many years, the two of them were in great love and traveled all over. And actually he forgot most of his kingly duties. 
And then one day, uh, Lord Indra saw that Urvasa was not in heaven anymore and decided it was time for her curse to be complete. He sent uh, two of his helpers down to steal the sheep. The sheep were stolen in the middle of the night when the king and, and uh, the celestial nymph were together. And hearing the sheep wailing, the king went running out to, to uh, save them. However, he had no clothes on. And when she saw this, she said, I'm leaving you. And he was extremely distraught and wandered around the kingdom, uh, just stricken with great distress and a very sorrowful heart and wailing. And finally, when she, he did see her, um, Urvasi spoke out and said, O oh, king, you're so foolish. Don't you understand that earthly men should never get uh, involved in these kind of relationships with beautiful celestial limbs, nymphs? And she said, Now go back and enjoy the pleasure of your kingdom and do not drown your mind further in sorrows. The king, though thus brought to his senses by Arabasi, was so much fascinated by her love that his heart did not feel any consolation, uh, and neither he felt um, just other than horrible pain, and was held in bondage by the love of this celestial nymph. And so that's how that chapter ends. And then we go on to the actual story. So we're on chapter 14 now. That was a synopsis of chapter 13. So here we are back with Sutta telling this story. So Sutta said, O Munis, now hear the main topic. Seeing the dark blue lady looking askance at him, Vedavyasa thought, indeed, what is to be done now? This celestial nymph is not someone that would make a good household for me to have a child. And then seeing Veda Vyasa so thoughtful about all of this, the celestial nymph became terrified and she assumed the form of a suka bird and flew away. Vyasa too became greatly surprised to see her in the form of a bird. The moment Veda Vyasa saw the extraordinary beautiful form of the celestial nymph, the cupid entered him into his body and his mind was filled with the thought of sweet feminine form and was gladdened and all his body was thrilled with pleasure so that the hairs of the, the body on his, the hairs on his body stood up on ends. The Muni Veda Vyasa tried his best and exerted his power of patience to its utmost, but failed to control his restless mind to enjoy this celestial nymph. Though he was very energetic and he tried repeatedly to control his heart, enchanted with the beautiful form of the celestial nymph, yet he could not, as due to a state of things preordained by gods and the control of his mind. At this state, when he was rubbing the fire sticks to get the sacred fire, the two pieces of wood used in kindling the fire, his seed fell upon the two pieces of wood used in kindling the fire. But he not, did not take any notice of this, and he went rubbing the sticks together when arose from, this, from the sticks this wonderfully beautiful form of Sukha Deva, looking like a second Veda Vyasa. This, born, this boy, born of the fire, looked brilliant like the blazing fire of the sacrifice place, whereon oblations of ghee are offered. Seeing that son, Veda Vyasa, was struck with great wonder and thought thus, What is this? How is it that my son is born without any woman? Thinking for a while, he came to the conclusion that this had certainly come to pass as the results of a boon 
granted to him by Lord Shiva. No sooner the fiery Sukadeva was born of the, of the two sticks that he looked brilliant, like fire, by his own tejas, his own spirit. At that time, Veda Vyasa began to look with one steady gaze at, his, at this blissful form of his son, brilliant with the divine fire. O oh, hermits, the river Ganges came there from the Himalayas and watch, washed all the inner nerves of this child, Sukadeva, by her holy water and showers of flowers were poured on her, his head. Veda Vyasa next performed all the natal ceremonies of the high-souled child. The celestial <clears throat> drums were sounded, and the celestial beings all came to dance, and the lords sang and played music with great joy for the sight of this beautiful sun. All the devas began to chant hymns with gladdened hearts at the sight of the of Sukadeva, the son of Ada Vyasa, born from the fire. No sooner the extraordinary brilliant Suda, Sukadeva was born than he grew up, and Veda Vyasa, who is master of endless learning and how to impart knowledge to others, performed his son's sacred third ceremony. No sooner the child was born, then all the Vedas, with all their secrets, began to flash in the mind of Sukadeva, as if it rained in Veda Vyasa. O Munis, Veda Vyasa gave the name of the child, Sukha, as during the moment of his birth, he saw the form of the celestial nymph in the form of the Sukha bird. Sukadeva then accepted Brihaspati as his guru and began devotedly with his whole head and heart to perform duly the brahmacharya bow, the life of a student and celibacy. The Muni Sukha remained in the house of his guru and studied the four Vedas with the secrets and all the sacred uh, scriptures and all the other Dharma Sastras. At the end, he gave Dakshina to his guru, according to the proper rules, and returned home to his father, Veda Vyasa. Seeing his son, Sukha, Veda Vyasa got up and received him with great love and honor, and embraced him and took the smell of his head. The holy Veda Vyasa asked about his welfare and about his studies and requested him to stay in that auspicious ashram. Veda Vyasa then thought of Sukha's marriage, and he became anxious and began to inquire where a beautiful girl of a Muni could be found. <clears throat> and he spoke to his son, O oh, highly intelligent one, you have now studied all the Vedas and Dharma Sastras. Therefore, O oh, sinless one, you better marry now, O oh, son, Take a beautiful wife, and leading a householder's life, worship the devas and the pitras, and be free from any debt. O highly fortunate son of mine, now enter into the life of householder and make me happy. O highly intelligent one, I have big expectations from you. Now try to fulfill them, O greatly wise Sukadeva. After a very s severe asceticism, I have got you, who are verily a deva born without any womb. I am therefore your father. Save me. When Vyasa spoke thus to Sukadeva, making him sit close by, the highly dispassionate Sukha at once made out that his father was terribly attached to the world and replied, O knower of Dharma, you have, by the power of your great intelligence, divided the Vedas into four parts. You have therefore advising me so now. I am your disciple, so give me true advice. Certainly I will obey your order. <clears throat> 
At this, Veda Vyasa said, O son, I have got you after I have performed very severe tapasya for 100 years and worshiped Lord Shiva in the sole object of having you. O highly wise one, I will ask some king and will give you sufficient wealth for your family expenses so that you, having attained this much desired youth, enjoy the householder's life. Hearing these words of, the fa of his father, Sukadeva said, O oh, father, kindly say this to me, that what pleasure is there on earth that is not mixed with pain? The happiness that is mixed with pain is not called happiness by the wise. O oh, highly fortunate one, when I will marry, I will become certainly submissive to my wife. See then how happiness can be possible to one who is dependent, especially to one dependent on one's wife. Rather, freedom can be obtained one day when one is, rather freedom can be obtained one day when one is tied to an iron or a wooden pillar but never freedom will come to the man who is tied by wife and children. As the body of a man is full of urine and theses, so is the body of a woman. The more so when I am born of no womb, how can I find happiness there, not only in this birth, but in my previous births too, I had no desire to be born in any womb. <clears throat> How can I desire now to enjoy the pleasure of a woman, the bliss of self that has got no other bliss equal to it? The high-souled person that find pleasure in their selves never go over after sensual pleasures of the objects of enjoyments. When I studied first the Vedas in detail, it struck me that the Vedas dealt with the sastra of karma manga, the way of action, and it is full of himsa, injury to others. Then I took Riyaspati as my guru to show me the way to true wisdom, but soon I found that he too was attacked with the dreadful disease of ignorance and plunged in the, the terrible ocean of world full of maya. So it became quite clear to my mind how could he save me? If the physician be diseased himself, how can he effect cures in others? When I am desirous of liberation, how can I get it from a guru who is himself deeply attached to the world? How can such a one treat my case to free me from the disease of attachment to this world? It would be merely a farce. I bowed down to the guru, and now I am come to you to save me, frightened by the terrible serpent of samsara. Day and night the jivas travel in this awful wheel of samsara, this constellation of zodiac. They are moving like the sun and never get any rest. O oh, Father, if we discuss about the truth of Atman, we will at once find that there is no trace of happiness in this samsara. As the woman enjoys pleasures in the midst of a feces, so the ignorant person finds pleasure in this samsara. Those who have studied the Vedas and other sastras and yet are attached to the world are certainly deluded and blind like horses. No one is more stupid and ignorant than those persons. Getting this extremely rare human birth and studying the Vedanta and other sastras, if there be attached, if he be attached to the world, then who are the men that will attain freedom? What more wonders can you find in this world than the fact that persons attached to wives, sons, and houses are denominated as pundits? That man who is not bound by this samsara composed of the three gunas of maya is pundit that man is intelligent and he has understood the real import of the sastras what use can there be in studying the sastras in vain 
that teach how to bind men more firmly in this samsara full of Mahamaya. That sastra ought to be studied, which tells how a man would be liberated. The house is called Gira, Girha, because it catches hold of a man firmly. So what happiness can you expect from the house, which is like a prison? O oh, Father, I am therefore afraid. Those pundits are certainly stupid, and they are certainly deceived by the Creator, who, having the birth even of men, become again imprisoned. Hearing these words of Sukha, Vyasa spoke as follows, O oh, son, the house is never a prison, nor is it the cause of any bondage. The householder whose mind is unattached can get muksha in spite of being such. Truthful, holy, caring, wealth, by just means, and performing according to the rules, the rites and ceremonies as stated in the Vedas, and doing Shraddha's duty, a householder can certainly attain muksha. See a man who is a brahmachari, who is an ascetic, who is follows any other method or vow, all have got to worship the householder after midday. The religious householder, too, welcomes these brahmacharis with sweet words and gives them food with great love and respect, and thus does them an honor. For this reason, the householder stage is the most excellent of all, and I have not seen or heard of any other ashram superior to it. For this reason, Vasista and other uh, pundits resorted to the householder life in spite of them being endowed with great wisdom. O oh, highly fortunate one, if one performs duly the rites and ceremonies of the Vedas, there is nothing that is impossible. Be it the birth in a good family, or the enjoyment of heaven, say, or be it muksha, Whatever desires, it is fructified to success. Also, there is no such rule that one will have to remain in one of the same ashrams throughout life. The pundits who know Dharma say that the pupils can go from one ashram to another stage of life. Therefore, O oh child, accept Agni, the householder's fire, and try your best to do well by your duties. O son, enter into a householder's life and appease the devis, petries of men's, procreate sons, and enjoy the pleasures of household life. When old age will come, then you can quit the house and take up the third stage of life and go into the forest and perform excellent vows and then take on the fourth stage of life which is total renunciation. O fortunate one, he who does not take a wife is certainly maddened by these indomitable organs of actions, five organs of sense and mind. Therefore, the makers of the Sastra say that to save oneself from pernicious influences of these vicious senses, one is to take a wife during his youth time and then be engaged in performing tapyas, tapasya, during his old age. O fortunate one, in days of yore, your, the fiery Rajarsi Vishvamitra practiced very severe tapasya without any food for 3,000 years, and though he was very strong and shining like fire, he was fascinated by the charm of the celestial nymph Menaka, and an auspicious daughter was born from the womb of Menaka by Vishvamitra. My father, <clears throat> Parasara, though a great ascetic, was st struck with Cupid's arrows at the sight of the daughter of a fisherman named Kali and accepted her in the boat. What more than this, that Brahma, seeing his own daughter, was struck by passion and ran after her when Bhagavan uh, Shiva made him unconscious by his sa sacred sound and made Brahma desist from that 
contempt. So, a fortunate one, take my word, pregnant of good issues, and marry a lady born of a good family, and follow the path presented in the Vedas. Thus ends the 14th chapter of the first book on the birth of Sukadeva and the duties of a householder in the Mahapurana Srimad Devi Bhagavatam of 18,000 verses by the Maharishi Veda Vyasa.